Hello, and welcome to Dogma Discussions. This is Vincent. So if you're new to my channel, Dogma Discussions is just that, discussing dogma, primarily religious dogma, but any kind of dogma qualifies. What I do in these videos, or um, really more audio than video, I tell a story from my life having to do with dogma and bring to light the dangers of dogma. A dogma harms people, harms their ability to be successful. Basically, the dangers of dogma. I welcome any comments you want to leave me and I will respond. Uh, and I ask that you like the videos and uh, subscribe to the channel. Hit the notification bell so you'll be alerted when I put a new video out. And share. Share the video. Right? Spread the word. Okay. The story I have for you tonight is uh, called The Dogma of Dominion Over the Earth. All righty. Here we go. In Genesis, God gives mankind dominion over birds, fish, and animals, as well as commanding people to multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. So, what's wrong with that? They're God's creations, right? He can do with them as He wishes. Well, if you believe that the Bible is the literal word of God, sure. Yet, are just his followers affected by that belief? What about everyone and everything else? What does this dogma do to them? If we look at history, we notice that the dogma of dominion has far-reaching implications. The very nature of its superiority has led to the destruction of people, animals, and the environment. Currently, many appear to believe that this attitude of supremacy is innate to Europeans, yet its origins are millennia old. From where? Well, from the Bible, of course. In it, God is A-OK -okay with violence and all kinds of bad stuff. For instance, in Deuteronomy, the Almighty instructs the Israelites concerning attacking a city. First, offer peace. If they accept, enslave the people. If they resist, siege the city. And when God delivers it, kill all the men and take the women, children, and animals as plunder. Wow, that's not very loving. It's even worse for cities that God gives to his people as an inheritance. In this situation, the Creator commands him to kill every breathing creature. Right, but that's the Old Testament. The New is nothing like that, is it? Well, in Matthew, Jesus commands his followers to make disciples of every nation. Where's the, if they're interested in becoming disciples, part? It isn't there. So, conquest is not just an Old Testament theme? Nope. And, in the 13th and 14th centuries, a series of papal declarations eventually codified this dogma of dominion as the so-called Doctrine of Discovery, which gave jurisdiction over the world to the Pope and his agents, stating that any non-Christian land could be taken and its people converted. As you can see, the papal directives combine the commands of both testaments. This doctrine was used for centuries afterwards by the nations of Europe, and not just the Catholic ones either. 
to promote Christian superiority, oppress and enslave the indigenous, and seize land and waterways throughout Africa, Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and the Americas. The doctrine of discovery has also been practiced in United States history, eventually becoming enshrined in federal law. In an 1823 Supreme Court case, the doctrine was used to nullify Native American claims to land. And when the desire to conquer and populate the Western U.S. captivated the American consciousness, the doctrine became rebranded. A newspaper editor in 1845 summed up the idea thusly, that it was America's manifest destiny to overspread the continent allotted by God for the free development of our yearly growing population. In 1898, President McKinley used the phrase to justify American imperialism. Quote, We need Hawaii just as much and a good deal more than California. It's manifest destiny. Unquote. Certainly, Hawaii's sugar cane industry and strategic location in the Pacific were the reasons it was coveted. But God's support of U.S. expansion was the justification. You see, once people feel they're better than others, because they believe that God is on their side, their actions know no bounds. Even in our current century, the doctrine's effects are still felt. A Supreme Court case in 2005 relied upon it to rule against the Oneida Indian Nation in a land case involving the state of New York. As Paul the Apostle says in Romans, If God is with us, who can be against us? Yet, Christian brutalization didn't stop with humans. In Genesis, before God found favor with Noah, the Almighty threatens to destroy not just people, but animals, creeping things, and birds of heaven. In Exodus, God killed all the firstborn of Egypt, even of animals. And, not surprisingly, the New Testament supports this idea of dominance. For example, in 1 Colossians, the author is clear that everything was created through God and for God. And, since God gave us dominion, we can do whatever we wish with anything on earth, right? Couple that with the idea of manifest destiny and you have the wholesale slaughter of countless buffalo. Wait, what? How are those two connected? Consider this quote from a U.S. military colonel in the 1800s when a wealthy hunter balked about the killing of so many of these majestic animals. Kill every buffalo you can, he said. Everyone dead is an Indian gone. So, how many were slaughtered? Well, it's estimated that buffalo had once numbered 30 million, and by the end of the 19th century, it had dropped to a few hundred. In Psalms, the poet writes that God gave man dominion over the works of his hands and put everything under his feet, like the earth. Notice how nature is not well depicted in the Bible. It's where Satan tempted Jesus, after all. In 2 Kings, when children mock the prophet Elisha for being bald, he curses them in God's name, which causes two bears to exit the woods and feast on the kids. 
And what about the snake in the Garden of Eden? Evil? Well, it's Satan, isn't it? So how has this attitude about nature affected its treatment? Well, many with such beliefs apparently don't feel the need to preserve or respect it. For example, the U.S. state of Indiana was 98% forested when Europeans arrived. Now, the only old-growth forests there are small and on private land. How about rivers? Surely we wouldn't pollute a source of nourishment, would we? In 1969, the Rouge River in Detroit was so polluted that it burned for seven hours straight. It was the only the environmental movement, originally driven mostly by the non-religious, which began to turn our land policies around. As the founder of Earth Day, Senator Gaylord Nelson said, the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of the environment, not the other way around. Yet, that isn't the attitude of believers with whom I've been involved. Case in point. Consider this conversation I had with a fellow church member hanging out one night at his apartment. Let me take you to that moment. Derek is a short, stocky guy with thick, curly hair, a bushy beard, and mischievous eyes. We sit on the floor of his living room, which is small and, the furnishings, spartan. Rock music drifts from the speakers of his large, antiquated stereo system. Vincent, Vincent, you worry too much about things. He is saying, smiling, it'll all be fine. Well, Derek, looking around, it seems to me that most Christians don't care about the environment. Hey, he says, pointing at me, God is all powerful. You know, I was once a Satanist. A fact that Derek had told me repeatedly, but I just nod. And, he continues, sitting up straighter, raising his chin in pride, I was one of his high priests. I had awesome power. Like one night, I was listening to the radio and wanted to hear a song. So, I close my eyes and focus on the station playing it. Next thing I know, the song comes on and the DJ says that someone had called in and requested it. Okay, I say confusedly. I'm not following. It was me, Vincent. His voice raises in glee as a smirk flashes across his face. I just thought about requesting it and the DJ received my mental message, but thought it had been a phone call. See? I just stare blankly. So he sighs impatiently and continues. If God is strong enough to pull me away from that kind of power, renewing the earth will be nothing in comparison. It's at that point that I realize Derek is off his rocker. He is so irrational that God converting him is somehow comparable to revitalizing the entire world. Frighteningly, this type of delusion is common among Christians, that we don't have to be good stewards, because God has it all under control. In the 15th century account of the conquistador, Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Baca, he travels across America after being shipwrecked near modern-day Galveston, Texas. At first, he admits to considering the natives to be inferior because of his Christian upbringing. Yet, over time, he realizes his mistake and seeks to protect them from enslavement. 
His enlightenment during his journey prompts one to question, what's to blame for the subjugation and abuse of non-European people, the wholesale slaughter of animals and the corruption of our lands? Is this evil inherent in the Europeans and their descendants, many of whom have done these terrible things? Or is their behavior a result of the dogma of dominion and its corruption of their minds? Is the way forward to focus only on the negative examples and ignore people like Alvar Nunez Cabeza de Baca? Or is it to acknowledge with fairness and humility the good and bad from European culture and make a new future together? Like Gandhi said, an eye for an eye makes the world blind. That's the end of my story. I thank you for listening. Again, hit the like button, subscribe, hit that notification bell, and share this video. Send me a comment. All right. Until next time, this is Vincent. Goodbye.